Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, bienvenidos y bienvenidas a una nueva sesión de Respuesta en Clima Ambiente para la Salud en las Américas. Les recordamos que tenemos interpretación, hay el botón de interpretación con la opción de inglés y español. We remind you that there is an interpretation option at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can choose either English or Spanish. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Primer recordatorio del día. Por favor, necesitamos que tengan listo un borrador de As su nombre. first reminder, please have ready a draft of your conceptual note ready, at least with the basic points of your guidelines for um, next Tuesday, October 25th. If you haven't done so far, please let your facilitator know if you're going to have other members or if you're going to join another group. Also for next week, please remember that we're going to have um, advanced monitoring session and that will be followed by an optional presentation. You can stay 30 minutes longer for a talk on biodiversity and food systems. I really recommend you this talk. It's organized by one of our partners in this course, the PAHO organization. We see new participants joining. Another important piece of information for all of you about phase two, it might change but uh, nothing radical. As you might remember, when you receive the concept note, you we um, receive five, 10 to 15 projects from you that will be approved and uh, will go to the next stage. Each project will receive from 10 to 15,000 US dollars. That's, that means that if you join another group or you fuse with another group, you will receive 20 to 30 thousand dollars. Regarding the deadlines or the schedules, they are of six months up to one year. Of course, depending on the scope, uh, you can extend the period without additional funding. Also, we would like to remind you that the in-person workshop for this course for the second phase will take place in Neuquén, Argentina in February 6th to 11th next year. Also, remember that on October the 26th, we're going to launch the Landsat Countdown 2022 report. One of its uh, facilitator, Mercy Borbon Cordova, and myself. We're going, uh, we're the authors, authors for the Ecuadorian chapter, so we really in, encourage you to participate. As uh, you know, all Thursdays we meet, uh, and this time we're going to talk about how to talk about science with the general public. Please remember to mute your mic and your attendance will be verified with uh, your presence on Zoom. Please also have your camera on so we can uh, make sure that you're around. There might be some answers that uh, due to the time limitations, some questions that might not be answered, sorry. So let's try to make uh, precise questions so we can make the most of our time. This session will take 90 minutes and the sessions will be recorded as it is uh, the case for uh, the session right now. And it will be uploaded in our website. As you know, also the website contains reference material. 
So today we have the privilege of having um, Anna Pais. Anna, when she was a little girl, she wanted to be like a Charles Darwin, a naturalist, but she ended up exploring the world with uh, her journalism. At the moment, she's a senior digital editor of Radio Ambulante, um, national public service uh, radio station. She also worked at the BBC. She's from Uruguay, and she calls herself an ambassador of Mars. And uh, Anna, we invite you to take the floor and share your presentation. Hi, everyone. Let me uh, share my screen so you can have a look at it. There it is. Great. Yes, as um, it was mentioned, uh, well, it's a pleasure for me to be with you today. I love seeing your faces and see how, uh, how you feel about the workshop. Uh, if I start talking too fast, please let me know because I tend to do it. So first of all, I would like to start talking a little bit about myself. I had a little introduction before. I'm a journalist. I'm from Uruguay. Uh, I work at Radio Ambulante. That is a radio station that talks uh, tells us stories about Latin America. I don't want to go deep into my CV, but I would like to talk about two moments that were important in my career, and that explain why I'm here with you. When I studied journalism 15 years ago at university, I focused on scientific journalism. It was a strategic because at that time no one was uh, covering that topic. So for me it was interesting to focus on a topic where I didn't have so much competition from real life journalists. So I, I was interested in looking uh, into interesting sources of information and I found really interesting people uh, to talk to. So I found millions of people uh, who were interested and they wanted to tell their story. That's how Cromo was born. It is a project uh, that I shared with uh, the Observador, where I was working at the time for having a specific time or slot to present scientific news. We presented that project, we were awarded the support that was in 2012. So I spent four years in Cromo. Then I was hired by BBC. So I moved to the US and then to England. So I started covering Latin American topics, but I, I was so passionate about science as well. I was working at the BBC uh, Spanish department that covered news in Spanish. And at that time, science was not really covered, which is uh, kind of ridiculous, especially after a pandemic, you know. But I tried to make it as light as possible. You know that uh, science uh, journalism at that time was slightly taking some space. So the first piece of news was uh, a note about fish uh, that escaped a lab uh, or a specific place, uh, a contained place uh, and uh, in Ecuador, and that would represent a threat to the biodiversity. And when I shared that, everyone was uh, uh, alarmed by it. And it, it was like the word spread very quickly. And also my colleagues, journalists and editors realized that there was a need to cover scientific needs in the news. So by all this, what I mean is that I am absolutely convinced 
how important science is in uh, the mass media, but we have to cover science, not from the curiosity side or the anecdotal side, but it's important to cover what is relevant for a community or for the entire humanity. So it's important to explain the processes, the limitations that it includes voices from experts and doesn't over explain topics, but on the other hand, it doesn't become too technical so that any lay person can understand it. So to find a middle term where we also understand the importance of science. Here we have the objectives for this workshop. And uh, well, this is what I mentioned about my um, career. I also started uh, what I would call inside YouTube a series of uh, science videos. Some of them were seen by more than 2 million people. One is about the infinite and the other one is about uh, the relativity theory. And you can check them out. Throughout the day or the workshop, I'm going to show you some fragments of those videos. So I wanted to start this workshop with a question for you. I'm sure that if you're here, you believe like me that it is important to disseminate information in science. Traditional programs don't prepare us to be effective communicators outside of our scientific realm. So my question to you is, in your opinion, why is it important to disseminate science? And for that, I would like to invite you to join this link, slido.com. You have it also in the chat. Also, you can join it with a QR code. And that's the access code if you need it. You can write your reasons there why it is important for you to disseminate science material. Let's uh, keep the QR for a minute so you can get in. I'm also going to look at the chat. Great. I see that you added it in the chat. Great. I'm seeing some answers. Why it is important to disseminate science for open knowledge, to make uh, important knowledge horizontal so that everyone can have access to knowledge to inform society. In Portuguese, también. Informar para cambiar. To inform, to change. To empower the people. To democratize science. There was one that went up very quickly, I couldn't read it. To democratize its use. Thank you. Again, to democratize science. There was something about influencing. And I saw a lot of comments linked to, let me see, 
to learn about a project and its impact on a horizontal manner. Yes, you can see there's some information about democratizing knowledge, which is uh, quite interesting also to inform with evidence to have a positive impact in society, to outreach people, again, to make knowledge horizontal great. I see we're all pretty much aligned about why it is important. Irene, if you agree, we can go back to the presentation. And there we go, perfect. Great. So, all that you said is true. And I would like to systematize all that and for this presentation. From some of the reasons that you mentioned, I'm going to talk about three main ones. The first one is to show, demonstrate that science determines our lives. Maybe if we had this kind of conversation in 2019, I would have had to convince some experts, US scientists, you might already know that, but if we had had this type of conversation in 2019, I could have got into an argument, but now it is so evident that science has a big impact in our daily life, setting aside the anti-vaccine people, we see that uh, during the pandemic, we realized that the science and the scientific method save lives from the mask use to vaccine development. We have realized that uh, it is important to trust science. And this is just one example of how it impacts on our lives. So in my experience as a scientific journalist, I see that not all researchers take a, a positive side on the pr how practical it is uh, to do science. And I know it can be uncomfortable. And it happens that in general scientists focus on how a discovery fits into a body of research. Well, the general public wants to know how this finding or how this development could affect their lives. So I think that even explaining why basic science is important and to provide practical examples from the past can help in having this added value of the real impact that science has. Then, one of the other things that was mentioned was to make science more diverse and inclusive. All these innovations that have a positive impact on our lives do not come arise on their own. They are the result of work and the ingenious of the scientific community. So this capacity to have a social impact, this ability is strictly linked to the individuals behind it, to the individuals who do science. This doesn't mean that science progresses thanks to brilliant individuals or brilliant minds that act on their own and in an isolated fashion. But rather, most of the complex problems of modern science can be solved in groups as a result of the different perspectives. The whole set is more than the individual unit. So uh, efficient scientific communication, I consider it to be essential to improve the problems of diversity and inclusion that also have an impact on science. It uh, allows science to be accessible to audiences and publics that would otherwise be excluded from the scientific process. And it also inspires vocation to show what some teams are doing 
is important for this purpose in itself to approach knowledge and to inspire vocations for those where in other ways science would not even be considered as a possibility and lastly science can help scientific dissemination can help to encourage informed decisions at all levels so all decisions whether they are personal public or company based are based on the um, beliefs and uh, proof of decision makers so what science can do is to make informed decisions based on proof at all levels the this is a great example but the pandemic the science was included in all individuals who assumed the importance of wearing masks and did so correctly by covering the mouth and nose in the correct way, everything we've seen in the past few years. But scientific evidence shows that in, in companies that establish protocols, health regulations, uh, governments that in, did not allow for huge social events, so it had an impact on public and private institutions that was based on science or at least that's that's what we expected so being able to encourage decisions based on informed decisions that is on evidence is extremely important that is one of the out positive outcomes of scientific dissemination and it's very easy to set examples with the pandemic because it's something that we were all impacted by. But the world is full of examples and we the situations become more and more complex from recycling at home to on how I do it, what I do, uh, to regulation of AI at government level. It will become more important to to be based on scientific evidence at all levels with people who will be able to think and resort to scientists and know how to do so. So scientific dissemination helps in the informed decision making process, not only when we talk about discoveries or scientific breakthroughs, but rather also by allowing the scientific method and critical thinking to be known that is extremely important nowadays and that will continue to be and increasingly so. So for this, I had the second exercise. And this is something that is going on in Uruguay, which is linked to climate change and health, which is the issue of clams. So, Clams are migrating before uh, uh, before they they can be harvested. So fisher uh, persons are losing their income and their livelihoods. So I don't know whether we are using the same slider system. Yes. So in the same link that you joined just earlier. No apologies. Uh, it's a different link. So in a, the same link, but with a different activation code, the idea is to do precisely this, to think of an exercise on how you would provide a headline, how you would address the general public about this topic. So the components would be plans that they are maturing before there is a, if, um, early, at an earlier date, there is a group of science, scientists And it's a problem that for fishermen, because they have to um, move and they're losing their sources of income and livelihoods, economic activity, basically. So here you have the activation code for you to join at slido.com. This, this exercise is a bit more complicated. It requires more input from your behalf. Uh, uh, ah, me están pidiendo si puedo escribir nuevamente la situación. So they're asking me whether I can describe the situation once again. 
So clams in and what the question is here. So the idea of this exercise is to make a headline for a news item, for instance, for a news platform. So the issue here is clams in Uruguay, which are maturing before the expected time because of climate change. And this is having an impact on the livelihoods and income of uh, fishermen in Uruguay. So how would you provide a headline for this news item? How would you sell this news to someone? So we have different uh, answers here. Our grandchildren might not be able to enjoy clams. The clams are affected by climate change. Climate change is affecting the clam production in Uruguay. Uh, fisher producers uh, are being affected. To preserve the nutritional value of clams is everyone's work. Premature clams put pressure on fishermen. Mm, clams early clams in our coast, clams close to the end. These are great headlines. Climate change affects um, clam production in Uruguay, uh, mollusks before the time, ready before time. Uh, climate change has an impact on the income uh, of fishermen. This is what we were discussing, uh, perhaps of seeing how this uh, can affect people personally. Uh, clam shortages lead to displacement of fishermen, uh, threat of climate change. Maybe there's something missing here, as in what the danger, the threat is. Uh, fishermen, mm, in danger because of climate change, what will happen to fishermen in Uruguay? Excellent. The um, clam production in danger, impact of climate change. Will clams be over because of climate change in Uruguay? Excellent. So. Here we see in this case, for this exercise, one of the key words that can work here is to say, for example, to mention the word clam. Specifically to locate it in Uruguay or not, whether I'm trying to target uh, whoever I want to target, whether it's affecting Uruguayans uh, to localize the issue, but it could also make people become more distant to this subject, for instance, if you're in Mexico. So depending on where you are and when you're reading the news from, we might want to mention Uruguay, we might want to mention the effect of climate change because there's some a detail that's terrible, but I'm going to mention it anyway. There is a great uh, erosion in general when it comes to climate change, and it's, it's having a ne negative impact. So climate change tends to be a very complex issue, and there is um, people are tired. So it might be important to mention that clams are having issues in Uruguay and they, they might not reach your plate, but not necessarily mention climate change. So as not to provide the answer so that we know how close the public might be and how sensitive the public might be to climate change and deciding whether we want to include it or not. But these are all variables that the exercise did not include. It was a bit of a trap, but it's a good idea that you start knowing about these factors based on this talk, which is how to reach the greater public. And this is the core of this conversation, of this discussion. Uh, climate change threatens the consumption and production of clams in the Uruguayan coasts. That's an, another headline. So the idea of doing this exercise was to start discussing this about 
the main, the central issue of this discussion for today, which is how to reach the general public. It's not necessary for you to do something that merits a Nobel Prize for its dissemination. The amount of times where I, my only subject was science that I covered and I did not have to publish and I called any scientist and said that I trusted, of course, and I said, well, I have nothing to publish. What are you up to? Uh, are you up to with something new? Have you published anything lately? No, nothing. And then they would tell me something incredible. And that happened many a time. So I think this is because there are pieces of research which are important for the community or for a specific community. And this that is already important. If this is affecting a group of people, it's already important for that group of people. And on the other hand, there are pieces of research which are an excuse to learn about something new and not necessarily because it is new. Just for you to have a reference, the uh, values of the BBC are to inform, entertain and um, disseminate. So the um, teaching, so informing, in itself can already be a purpose that you might fulfill because it provides the opportunity to learn something new for many people. So let's try to reach this greater audience in order to provide information to them. There are different ways to start disseminating information. There's the notion of pitching ideas. This is uh, an undesigned word. I think someone's microphone just uh, turned on. I hope they're fine because the is screening. First thing, a pitching is to present an idea. So presenting an idea to local media and international media of general information, for instance, a national uh, newspaper, to pitch ideas to specialized local and international media in, on science, to propose a project to publish contents on the web or the channels of communication of the institution where we work or where we studied, this is something that's also quite valuable. And it, if you have a, a communications department within your institution, you might have someone approach you for that to propose a project to publish a content on the web or channels of, um, of the different organizations. It can be NGOs, scientific associations. You can also give talks in schools or secondary schools for special times of the year, such as Earth Day or others, depending on what might be relevant, but we don't need an excuse. I think the days of uh, these the commemoration days are just excuses for, for journalists and even for teachers to provide some context, but I think it's important that we do it. We don't need to wait for a specific date to take place that was set by the United Nations to do so. And then there's also the option of you creating a blog, a podcast, or creating an account on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Twitch. These are all options on how you can disseminate information. So what I wanted to say with this is whatever you choose, you'll not be able to do everything you need to decide and choose. When you decide to disseminate science, you'll have to make a pick. And as I told you already, I worked in national media, general media and specialized media and international media. On uh, paper format, hard and soft copies, I made text, audio, social media, so a bit of everything. And I, if I had to recommend something to you, if you had to choose one thing, then I would go for YouTube. And why? Because the uh, users of this platform has been increasing over time, and it has it had an uh, there has been an explosion of users after the pandemic. And for you to have an idea 
right now, a user in the US consumes 78 minutes per day. So that's one hour and 18 minutes of digital videos on their uh, devices. We're not even talking about TV. So it's an hour and 18 minutes. And at the same time, YouTube is the second most visited platform on uh, on the whole world, only after Google, of all websites that exist. So I know that making videos is a bit difficult and you might be thinking, I'm not able to edit a video. So perhaps it would be useful to know that I am not originally natural at this and you can do it as well this is one of my <laughs> print screens by recording a video i was was preparing and what i have here to say is that i joined journalism because i'm passionate about writing and this is what i do mainly to date and even though it's been years since i've been on tv I still find it exhausting mentally, and I'm still a bit embarrassed. So I think because of that precisely, my example might be useful because what I did was to learn in practice and you can do it as well. So now yes, four keys to speaking to the general public. The keys will be uh, focused on videos, but everything I will say applies to any kind of dissemination network that you use. So the examples will be focused on videos, but, but, but many of the things I'll mention can be extrapolated to other platforms as well. So I cheated. Before I started, there's a point number zero. That means that before you start to disseminate, as I was saying with the example of clams, you have to choose an objective public before you start a press communication, a transcription, a publication on Twitter, we need to know who we are addressing. It's not the same to create a YouTube channel on algebra for preschoolers than to university students advanced in mathematics. So these are two different ways of speaking and addressing to the public. So for that, it's important that you study the audience and that you know and that you do some research on what other institutions or professionals are doing, even in other languages, that you know to, to gather what's relevant, to learn about your mistakes or other people's mistakes and other components. So when I started with the series of communicative videos on the YouTube science on BBC World, there was nothing similar in Spanish. This idea of creating videos of up to five minutes that would discuss disciplines such as math, science, and ecology in an amusing and a dynamic way with music and videos and images did not exist. It was quite enriching. So, por ejemplo, en este caso, el público. So, the target audience were people that might probably be ending their secondary school. And in this video, about primal numbers. I'm going to show you this as an example. So you can have an idea about the target. Incluso podría hacer colapsar el sistema financiero mundial. Before we explain um, the more in depth uh, primal numbers, are those that cannot be divided? Uh, uh, for example, three is a primal number, but we're not. I'm going to leave it there as it goes really fast. So the explanation about this is that uh, people understand the concept. However, we give a brief explanation of what prime numbers are because my, people might have forgotten what they mean. Prime numbers 
Sorry. Okay. So, I'm going to go to item one. I know that you might have seen this in other workshops, but I consider it is important to mention that when you write a script, it's important to take these items into account. First, have a good start. Following the example of the video, in YouTube, for example, you see this video has uh, 500,000 videos and uh, visualization or views means that uh, the person has uh, seen it for more than uh, 15 seconds. And Netflix, which has a great level of AI, they discovered that viewers decide if they're going to continue watching a video in a matter of five seconds. So that's according to their research. Something that is also very important when we structure information is to have narrative with baits. What do I mean by this? Is that when we communicate something, when we're doing, for example, a documentary or work on TikTok, you leave sorts of baits that entice viewers to keep viewing so that they are curious about what's coming next. Number three is to effectively explain what was proposed in the title. To say to someone that you're going to do a video about a certain topic and then it ends up not being the core matter, it is quite disappointing. So if you consume a piece of information or a video or a thread on Twitter and the information that you promise is not there, you lose that person. They're not going to come back. They're not going to read you again because basically you lied to them. Another important aspect is to leave the person curious to know more, but never in doubt. Of course, we can't explain everything about, for example, the passage of a hurricane and all the people living there. Of course, you cannot explain a whole phenomenon in a short video, but at least it should give the person an overview and not bring, leave you with more doubts that information. And finally, to end with something that stimulates sharing or opinion. Someone has their mic on. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for turning it off. As I was saying, when we end reading an article or watching a video, it's great when we feel like we want to keep navigating in that channel or they follow you or they share it with someone. And of course, that helps the knowledge spread. Regarding duration, I'm leaving it as a question mark because what I have confirmed everywhere I've worked at and in all the formats I've worked on, there's not an ideal duration. It will take as long as it takes to have an interesting piece of information. I know it's quite subjective. But there are some things that we know, we don't know that we know, but we are all natural storytellers. Maybe at a, at a birthday party, anywhere. And we all know and we can feel when the narrative have, has its climax and when you're losing people's attention. And the same thing happens when we explain a piece of research or work 
we're doing. There is a certain instinct that we have. So we feel the what, what is the tipping point, or the most important point on when we lose interest and when it's a good time to end. So how to structure information? What I'm going to show you here, it's about the uh, last of Fermat's theory, theorem. What is interesting here is the narrative that is trying to catch people's attention. They try to catch you, and I'm going to show you the very beginning. And then I'd like to show you a bit later on where I found this problem and how to say something very specialized and how I tried to do it. This is the very beginning of the, the video. This story starts with a riddle in Latin in an old book. And the text says, I've discovered a demonstration that is quite wonderful but uh, it's quite um, straight. It was written by French Pierre de Fermat. The, his demonstration was never, never became public, and many years passed after that. And the most brilliant minds tried to resolve that, except for one. So this is a theory the last theorem of Fermat. So with this bit, what I'm trying to say is that this is fascinating and many people try to solve this problem. They couldn't do it except for one. So people might ask, who was this person? So that's an example that I wanted to show you. And here, I want to show you how we can address a non-specialized audience. If we're talking that the most brilliant minds in the mathematic realm couldn't solve this problem, it might also mean that as a journalist, I'm not going to be able to explain this to you, no matter what you do in your daily life. So, if the video is about this theorem, at some point I have to tell my audience that I'm not going to explain this deeply because I will leave people with more doubts than certainties. So, here is what I said. Colleagues brought together concepts that no one knew were linked, but looking into the evidence would mean taking years of a specialized knowledge to go into. But to give you a brief explanation, we can talk about elliptic curves. The fact is that in 2017, so this is my way of saying that we're not going deep into this. It's really hard. It's I'm amazing what this person did. Um, please believe me, that's what I said. You might agree with the way I solved this or not, but I believe it's imp always important to tell my audience that uh, maybe the people seeing this video might not be the brilliant uh, mathematics practitioners are, who are going to solve this problem. So how can I implement all this? If, for example, you're going to write an article, you just need a laptop and a work processor. But if you're going to make a video, we have to go into more technical details. So don't be scared. I'm not going to go deep into that. However, I'm going to touch upon a few aspects. Maybe before the pandemic, 
we used to give a lot of importance to the scenography. We wanted everything to be absolutely perfect. But the videos that I showed you here, I filmed them at home before I used to record them in a studio. But during the pandemic, we all were forced to work from home and we realized it was not that important to have everything look super professional. Of course, we need to meet some standards so that what we show in the video is not uh, too distracting. So first of all, a camera, any good cell phone films on HD and some others uh, film on 4K. This is something that you can adjust in your cameras. But by I, what I mean by all this is that it's quite easy to use your phone. You can, regarding light, you can use natural light. Try not to have a reflection on your face. For example, here um, I'm recording from my home and there's not much contrast on the image um, regarding microphone i do recommend you to use a professional microphone you can use any microphone you want except the microphone that comes with your phone directly from the phone because otherwise you're going to have so much echo that it's going to be annoying regarding scenography try to use a background that is not distracting if you have for example people walking in, in front of a window don't record that right the idea is to focus your audience's attention on you also for the clothing if you have a t-shirt with a written message that might be distracting and also don't use the kind of t-shirt that i'm wearing right now with a stripe it causes that what is called a more effect because it causes a weird effect on camera so you have your camera, your lights, you have your clothes on, and then you start recording. And my piece of advice here is be yourselves. When you look at the camera and you start talking, speak naturally. Being passionate doesn't mean that you have to be smiling all the time or talking loud, unless that's the way your personality is naturally. In my scripts, what I do is I use my natural physical body language movements and I have a little girl, she's two years, and she does this kind of gesture as well. So uh, you can see, I kind of raise my brow there. That is part of my script because it's a very natural expression to me because I feel that I can explain something with that little detail. The same thing happens when we write. So always try to feel as comfortable as you can when you write um, and you speak. Let's say that you have information in a file, in an audio or video file, and then you have to do the editing. And I'm going to do the following. I'm going, 
I'm going to tell you that learning to edit a video takes a lot of time. So the only thing that I can tell you right now is practice. There are many tools available that can be free or paid. TikTok or Instagram, they have their own editing integrated tools. They help you synchronize with the sound, music, but all you need there is basically practice, trial and error. We always have to experiment and uh, know what works and what doesn't. Always look uh, at a tutorial and um, I think that's what matters the most. De pensar una idea, picharla, escribirla eh, y la tienen terminada. Y en el caso de un video, además, lo han editado. Eh, so once you have the video that has been pitched, you are left with this other step. In the case of YouTube, for example, which is what I've been discussing mainly, the title, the headline of the video is very important for the search engine optimization or the optimization of search engines. The words that you include in a headline are the words that will be uh, shown so that when you search in an engine, for instance, clams in Uruguay, you'll see that article about how clams are are being affected in Uruguay because of climate change. So Google will probably say, oh, this person is looking for this. Here you have this article and this video with these key words. Let's provide it as a result of the search. So SEO is very important. Thumbnail, which is basically the image, for example, it can be a picture uh, that you see on the article. It can be the image that you use to promote this video. This is also extremely important because also there, Google has gained more intelligence in image recognition and it, it provides much important, importance to this because it can read text within images and can uh, determine whether there's a person, an animal in that picture. So this also helps in the search process and for people to actually find what you wrote, what you created. Uh, in terms of scientific dissemination. What else? By uploading a video, and this is something that we discussed, it can be on YouTube or on Facebook or on Instagram, but you can have the option of adding captions. In a video, if you speak in Spanish, you have the option of providing subtitles in Spanish. That's extremely important, not also because of inclusion, but also because there might be people who want to watch this on low volume because they are in bed with someone else and they don't want to have a loud volume. So they might want to watch this with uh, captions. Irene, she's trying to say something. Yes, that we're already getting to the uh, time of the end of the presentation. Okay, so I will speed it up. So basically what I wanted to say is that this is important regarding um, how to share this. And this is something that I do every, in Radio Ambulante. Every time we have this, uh, you can see the picture on the right-hand side. It's a way of promoting the product. The, Members of the team are shared with this document on Tuesdays when we issue a new episode. And you have the link to the video, the person who is involved and the person they should label. And I even provide them with the option of copy and paste so that if they want to share this on Twitter, they don't have to start thinking themselves about what the message will be. You can rather, you can just go ahead and copy and paste it. So in this way, we are providing your team of researchers a way in which they can share in a very simple way, in a very simplified manner, where we don't require much effort from people. They can focus on their work and you can just copy and paste it on WhatsApp, on social media, and this can help them share the content that was created 
without having to start looking for the link, looking about the thumbnail of the person, knowing what the Twitter account is, which department it belongs to. So this is a very simple way of doing it. And it's something I highly recommend. This is something we do in Radio Ambulante for a while and it's been working excellently. Now I'll speed it up so that we can get to the last key point, number four, um, which is learning. Learning from what was done and uh, analyzing uh, quantitatively in terms of metrics and comments for qualitative input based on the comments, for instance, on social media. And lastly, to experiment. If something worked, why did it work? Was it the subject? Was it the headline? Was it the thumbnail? Was it the time in which it was published? So these components are extremely important so we can learn about what worked and what we can improve on. So only in this way can we achieve this. This is trial and error. And this is something that you probably already know and that you might be able to do yourselves. This is something that I just had as an option for us to watch, but we're going to skip it because of lack of time. Perhaps we can share the link of the presentation on the website so that the rest of the material can be accessed by participants. Well, I just wanted to conclude by saying that Perhaps you're a bit overwhelmed right now after everything I've said and of all the work that this entails, but disseminating information is not simple. But as I said at the beginning, it's the way in which we can show that science, how science shapes our way of living, how it informs our decisions, and it's also a way to promote informed decision making. And who knows, perhaps by doing what, what you do, you might inspire vocation within your communities or in other parts of the world. And if you're in, like me in any way, then hopefully all of this will have a positive impact and the effort is worth it. Thank you. And now, yes, if you have any questions, I don't know if you leave them on the chat or yes, okay. So in the Q&A or chat section, please write your questions and straightforward questions so that we have the opportunity uh, to answer them. You can also ask directly in, in English. So the first question, Anna, from Elizabeth Estaño, is what do you think about working with professionals in uh, outsourcing editing of the video so that we can focus on producing the content. Well, I think it's excellent. Of course, I advocate for, I defend scientists' work. And of course, I think that it's important that we consult with specialists because there are specific specialists for a given domain, but I think it's, important, the expertise we have as communicators, we know how to say things, how to structure things. And so I think that all dissemination efforts for scientific information should be uh, channeled in the same way. But I, of course, if there is a budget to hire someone to edit the video, of course, it will be better. The editing will be better. There will have visual effects that will make it more appealing. I edited my own videos, but of course, when someone else does it, includes video, um, music, and knows how to embed the music, they also add animations that might be relevant. Of course, it's much better. And that's a video that I wanted to show you about black holes. And it's so much better than the videos that I edited myself. And so if uh, within the department or institution that you work in, if there's a budget for it, then of course, go ahead. Is there some kind of instrument in order to do a mapping of the institutions in order to disseminate or to promote the research done by scientists. Well, unfortunately, in the case of Latin America, we're uh, not the best at it of knowing how to sell ourselves and to do so correctly. 
So there are institutions, and I could look it up and share it with you, but there is, maybe it's not that clear either. I don't know if you know the conversation, which is a platform where there are experts who write their own articles, and behind that there are journalists. And what they do is, uh, in the Conversation UK, there's a section for topics in the UK. So, so there are scientists of the UK speaking about their pieces of research, and there are journalists who edit the news. They are taught on how to present the topic, how they ensemble the whole article. And the conversation also has creative comms, so portals can use this in their own portals and quote them. So what this has created, has resulted in, is to combine, to have the perfect mix between expertise of scientists who are speaking directly to the public. They are controlling what they want to say and how they want to say it. But there are as a journal of journalists who teach them on how to present information, they are on how to structure it. But I am not sure about whether such a thing exists in Latin America, although I would be interested in knowing because the conversation has an edition in Spain, which isn't Spanish, but it's in Spain. And in the US, they discuss topics on Latin America, but in English. And so Este sitio en particular, right por now, this particular site, uh, what you're doing is very interesting. It's midway between covering Latin America, but in English, or doing it in Spanish, but um, of course in, in Spain. There are two questions which are related. How do can we do dissemination uh, in rural areas where internet connection access is limited and how do we manage to have an effective dissemination when we work with communities which are not general users of social media i think that in these cases it's the old school method that is best if some if the pandemic has shown us anything is that the radio is still an important dissemination method tv and the problem is that the access of TV is different as well, but radio is perfect in this sense. And then meetup places. It could be that in that uh, village, there is a rural school that works in a way as a meeting point or assembly point from the local population. It could be anywhere. It could be church. It could be... Uh, there are many places where we have a meeting point. It can be a community center, a local government center where we can approach and give a talk. And we can use the existing networks of that place to our benefit, knowing who the leaders of this community are, who can, we can approach that will be uh, useful. And this is actually quite effective because if these are isolated, places, rural areas, the fact that someone wants to approach the community, present something, it's already interesting in itself because they feel that they are being paid attention to and there is an opportunity to learn about something new. And so I think that um, reception of these events is quite useful and you have to resort to other pra older, pra I mean, traditional practices. Radio is something that you can't miss. It's omnipresent, let's say, in all places. Oh, there's a question precisely related to the radio. How can we bring science to life through the radio where there is no visual support? Well, I think that with the radio, the beauty of it is that First of all, we can make descriptions. And if I'm saying that it's been 200 years since this river uh, has been providing the community with everything they need, water, food. And right now, I don't know, for example, people need to walk 10 minutes more 
where food and water was available before. So the power of images that we can transmit walking for 10 more minutes, or for example, you can provide an audio where you describe that it was very difficult to uh, speak in a given location because insects were chirping so loudly that people could not speak and they were not heard. So look at how we are listening to the silence in this location now. It's been uh, uh, many years since trees have been cut and we are able to, through silence, transmit what changes have taken place in the given location. So I think that radio has a huge power to disseminate information. Right now I'm working on a podcast and everything we do is audio input. And it's something marvelous because TV means that requires full attention and the radio can be something you do while doing the dishes or you can go walking and it can it can join you to many places as well. So if you are into producing radio or podcast material, I think these are excellent channels to do so. There's also a question on whether the disseminator is a translator of scientists for the general public because scientific topics are complex and difficult to explain and how can they be transferred to a lay person? Well, I think that you are in a way, as a disseminator, you're a translator in a, in a way. And I always think of, I had a professor of journalism who said that uh, a journalist from his team would approach him and say, well, I had an interview, it was amazing, and tells a fascinating story, and everything, everyone is so enthusiastic. He sits down, uh, starts writing it, and ends up doing it in a very dull way. So the first thing, why don't you start in the same way as you heard the story, so that people are amazed and in awe? So I think that we, have to be a translator in a way of that of those emotions and knowing when people are in awe and knowing that this will be a good hook to grab the audience's attention and one other thing that i also reflect on is to have someone in mind when i'm writing this notion of being a translator we need to know who our target audience is we i work with mass media and i think of my mom how would i tell this to my mother how and i can provide some scientific terminology but there's also a point where she needs to know up to a certain point some technical vocabulary. I refuse to use specific scientific terminology, which make no sense in a given context, which can end up just being too complicated. Instead, you can just refer to the name and paraphrase uh, what it actually means. So you can also kind of apologize that you're using a scientific term, but uh, not make the audience believe that because they did not understand that word, they are not able to follow the rest of the article. In a way, it's as if you were reading something in Spanish and suddenly you have a sentence in German. You don't speak German and suddenly you feel that, well, why am I given this? Why would I continue to read if I can't understand? So we need to assess at what point we provide a word in German following the metaphor and the person is not uh, excluded from the article. Or you can just say, as we say in Germany, then you provide the word and you paraphrase. And I've only been given one word that I don't know, but there is not a full sentence in German that I don't know. I don't know if this metaphor helped. Yes, thank you. There's another question from Marisol. Which would you say are the most common mistakes when disseminating science? I think one of the most common mistakes is to think that what people are interested in science is, is what's curious or 
if I said, well, in a lab in South Korea, there was a rat with two heads. Well, perhaps it's more relevant for people to be told that whether eating one egg a day is unhealthy or not. This is something that a colleague of mine brought to the table. Um, every day she had uh, three eggs for breakfast and I was wondering whether that was unhealthy and that became an article that we actually wrote. So uh, can is it healthy to eat three eggs a day? That was the uh, article. I don't think that this rat lab rat with two heads is as relevant as inquiring whether eating three eggs or for breakfast is relevant so we have to stop thinking of of science as this crazy genius who develops strange things in a lab and who will be able to revive a mammoth so i don't think that's going to be more relevant than what affects us on a daily basis I'm interested maybe in finding out whether in my city water levels are being managed in a good way and or in, if in 50 years we will have to migrate because of the rising sea levels. Of course, it's more in, it's important to engage people by telling them it's people are going to be more engaged in knowing whether uh, in 50 years where they live, uh, the area is going to be affected. This is more interesting than knowing whether mammoths can be revived. So I think that is one of the biggest mistakes. And the other thing, the other mistake, and it's something that happens a lot, it's to only uh, ask, um, only ask questions to scientists. And it's important that you make yourselves known. Journalists tend to always consult the same people. And perhaps we have a colleague who wrote an article about Alzheimer's and uh, the journalist might already know a specialist who knows, a scientist who knows about uh, And you can share the contact details. So to the extent where you can see a larger pool of people working on this, we can make sure to have a variety of different sources that we can use and perhaps the information that we are accessing on. I don't know. I don't know how good it is to eat meat for global warming, but there might be an explanation from the third world. Uh, but if uh, you live in London and you eat avocado and it was brought from Mexico along with some eggs that came from Africa uh, that, um, you know, traces back to Sri Lanka. So maybe if I eat um, breakfast from a local um, from local food, it might be less harmful. So, you know, it, we need to have several discussions where the variety of sources of information is very important because it provides us with different perspectives. You said it would be good to have quantitative data, to have metrics to assess the impact of the dissemination of information. You didn't give us an example, though. How could you do the metrics? What tools would you recommend? Yes, I'm sorry, I, I, as I had to go really fast. But wherever you share information, for example, if you disseminate in a blog, websites, they intend to work with uh, metrics, their own metrics. You can see how long people spent reading or whether the article was written from a laptop or a phone that has an influence. As we know nowadays, 80% of content is consumed from 
a phone. So it might be important for your article to be uh, formatted according to that. Or if you post on Instagram, the tool has its own metrics. You can see how many people watched your video, for example, how many, what percentages were men, women. So they have their own integrated metrics. Sometimes it can mean something, sometimes it doesn't mean anything. For example, if 80% of your public is men, there you have some information about what type of people is uh, your actual target. Or maybe it uh, can be a source of information for changing your content. And uh, for example, if you, according to the metrics, realize that you're reaching an audience, uh, people under age or maybe college students, and that might give you an idea of how, what kind of vocabulary you can use. And in the case of older people who are not very um, technological. You gave us an example, rural schools. How do you reach them? And how do you measure impact there? That's a good question. WhatsApp. <laughs> WhatsApp, to be honest is a social media somehow, messaging media. It has a, an impressive scope. You might know that, for example, when there's an electoral campaign, you end up receiving at least one uh, message from a candidate. It's, of course, a bit difficult to measure that. So if you use WhatsApp. Also, my piece of advice would be to don't create content. Don't create content only on WhatsApp, so it ends up disappearing. The idea is that you catch people's attention through different media so that they can at some point go to your home of information, for example, your website. Because for example, if you post it on Instagram, you might catch people's attention, but maybe something changes in the policy of Instagram and you lose your audience. But if you know that at some point your audience is going to go to your website, you're going to follow you no matter what happens. So it is important that people use, for example, branding, meaning always having your logo on your videos so people can identify your institution with the content you're sharing. And it also gives an idea of credibility. If a video has a watermark with a pajo in there, it's more credible, right? But if we just get an image that doesn't say where it comes from and it talks about bats, I'm not going to rely on it that much. For example, if I hear some story about weird bats and I don't know where the video comes from, it's that, you know, I'm going to doubt, but if I know that I can identify a video with a, um, a good source of information, for example, Bajo or any other institute, I'm going to rely on it more. I'm going to trust it more, right? So I believe that in the case of your question, WhatsApp can work maybe for community centers that can work as well. Because meeting points in the physical world still exist, right, in small towns, because we always need to get together physically. So finding those common places. 
would be good. For example, you can go to a local community and go to that meeting point and talk to the people in charge and express a concern or something that you want to share with them. Thank you very much, Anna. It was such a privilege to have you with us today. The pleasure has been mine. It was, uh, I had a lot of fun. It was amazing. You were very generous with that knowledge you shared with us. And we hope that the questions that couldn't be answered it will be answered uh, later on. There are very few left to answer, so I'm very pleased. I'd like to give a couple of announcements before we close. You can also continue using the chat if you still have more questions left or you have any comments. For Anna, thank you again. Thank you so much for being with us today. For those who arrived a little bit later, the initial reminders were that you need to prepare your conceptual note by Tuesday, October 25th. Remember that you have to follow the guidelines from the concept note guidelines. Also, please let your facilitator know whether you're adding a new member or merging with another team. The next meeting will be on Tuesday, uh, sorry, on Monday. It will be in the morning for those on the Pacific Coast and later for those in Latin America and the Caribbean. Also, we will have an additional session next Tuesday. It will take 30 minutes. It's about biodiversity and food systems. That was specially prepared for the participants of this course thanks to the support of PAHO. We invite you to join us. It will be very interesting. And finally, please remember that for phase two, we anticipate that between 10 and 15 projects will be approved. Each approved project will receive ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and if you merge with another group, the total amount for the two groups will be from twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Regarding the project time frame, it can be from seven mo six months to one year, with a possible no cost extension possible. Finally, the in person workshop for phase two will take place in Neuquén, Argentina, in February the 6th to 11th, to the 2023. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you again, Ana. And we'll see you back on Monday or on Tuesday for our monitoring session.